Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rangita De Silva de Alves, a human rights scholar and practitioner with over 25 years of experience. She is a visiting fellow at Harvard Law School and associate dean of international programs at Penn Law School. Until this January, she directed the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Woodrow Wilson Center's Global Leadership Initiative and Women in Public Service Project, launched by Secretary Clinton and the Seven Sisters Colleges. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. First of all, I want to start by paying tribute. Paying tribute and showing gratitude is a cornerstone of leadership. I want to pay tribute to Joanne Murray and Professor Joe Joyce, the two architects of the Albright Institute, for inspiring this uncommon network of global women leaders. They are the pioneers who brought an idea to life and built a movement. Yes, you are part of a movement. A movement that was built six years ago and will endure for generations to come. So you are part of a transnational, intergenerational movement of women leaders. Congratulations to the newest class of the Albright Institute. It was humbling for me to read your stories and it is humbling for me to be part of your journey. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Joanne, for inviting me year after year to join you in this triumphant and joyous journey that you are embarking. 2015 is an inflection point in the history of the global women's movement. And you will mark this year. You will look back and you will say 2015 was a watershed year and it is your time. 2015 will launch the new development agenda, the SDGs. 2015 also marks the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Platform of Action and the Beijing Women's World Conference. 20 years ago, then First Lady Secretary Hillary Clinton reminded the world that women's rights are human rights and the global women's movement was reborn. And recently, Secretary Clinton has said, Women's decision making is the unfinished business of the 21st century. And all of you are here today to finish that unfinished business of the 21st century. My talk today is a narrative of women and policy making. What happens when women are at the table? When women are at the table, how are new laws and policies reimagined? I want to take you on a tour de force of lawmaking. And I hope that this discussion will give you a toolbox that you can use as decision makers, as policy makers, and lawmakers. And I will use a few major lawmaking processes that I have been privileged to engage in as prisons to examine the question of lawmaking. Given that today marks the fourth anniversary of the Arab Revolution, I will start with constitution building in Tunisia. I will be leaving for Tunisia on Monday to work with women policymakers on enforcement and institutionalizing of the Tunisian constitution. Constitutions, as you know, are the supreme laws of the land. And the new Tunisian constitution helps to shape a new narrative for a country and its people and is a standard setting document for the MENA region. Constitutions embody a state's values, the historical experiences, the memories of a state and the way forward for state rebuilding. Constitutions also provide new beginnings for communities and allow for addressing the flaws that might have led to conflict. Appropriately, the preamble to the Tunisian constitution uses language that addresses the conflict. 
and the ways in which a historic moment post-conflict has been captured. So I quote from the preamble, taking pride in the struggle of our people to gain independence and to build the state to eliminate autocracy and achieve free will as a realization of the objectives of the revolution of freedom and dignity. The revolutions of December 17th to 14th January 2011 is remembered as well as the blood of our blessed martyrs and the sacrifices of Tunisian men and women over generations and we resolve by this constitution to break with oppression injustice and corruption. Why I repeat these words to you is to look at the ways in which new narratives are woven by post-conflict constitutions. Language like this are not embedded or enshrined in earlier versions of constitutions. These are post-conflict constitutions which capture a particular historic moment. And I recall the Rwandan constitution. This year we also celebrate 20 years, the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. And I want to quote from you the preamble to the Rwandan constitution so you understand the parallels and the power of language to shape not just new constitutions but new communities and new states. The preamble states, we the people of Rwanda in the wake of genocide that was organized and supervised by unworthy leaders and other perpetrators that decimated more than a million sons and daughters of Rwanda are resolved to fight the ideology of genocide and all its manifestations and to eradicate ethnic, regional and any other form of divisions. So you see how important it is for constitutions to create new narratives and to pay homage to the histories that led to the constitution. So going back to the Tunisian constitution, what we saw in the last two years was a process driven constitution making. Over a period of two years, more than thousand public consultations were held to build the constitution and the constituent assembly of Tunisia had the opportunity to meet with members of the community, both men and women, so that all recommendations could be transcribed and collated. What is exciting about the Tunisian constitution is that it is different from traditional constitutions. Traditional constitutions primarily focused on civil and political rights. What we see when we read the Tunisian constitution is a story of the Tunisian people and the needs of the Tunisian people. So for example, the Tunisian constitution guarantees youth rights, it guarantees the right to water and it also has an anti-violence against women provision. This is extremely pioneering in the ways in which constitution, the Tunisian constitution has been envisioned. Never before has a, tu a constitution embedded an anti-violence against women provision. This is what happens when women are at the table, when women help to shape laws, policies and constitutions. As you know, historically men drafted laws in the image of men and women were absent from the policy making table. Across the world when both men and women are at the policy making table, laws are more dynamic and capture the real life experiences of both men and women. I was in Peru a few weeks ago speaking to an inauguration of a network of women parliamentarians and women and men in educational institutions, <coughs> leaders, the presidents of 67 academic institutions in Peru. I learned at that event that because more women were policy makers and leaders in parliament, Peru had discontinued night sittings for parliament. It reminded me then of Kim Campbell, the former Prime Minister of Canada, who stated that night 
part-time committee sittings were one of the biggest barriers to women's equal participation in public life. At the same time, she said, it disallowed men, male parliamentarians, from playing an equal role in caregiving activities. And when she discontinued committee sittings in the night, her male peers thanked her for doing so. Because more women were at the table, Peru grants four consecutive days of paid mandatory leave for men in public life to take time off when their wives or partners give birth. So this is an advantage. This is a way in which when women are at the table, male, male leaders' lives are transformed and communities are transformed. Providing mandatory leave to men sends a clear message that male leaders too have family responsibilities and that caregiving is not just a women's priority but a national priority. This again shows the importance of language and the need to feminize power and politics. Peru passed a law on equal opportunities for men and women which stipulated that government should incorporate and promote gender sensitive language in all written communications and documents prepared by government entities. What this shows is that language is not innocent. Language has power to transform communities. Language is normative and constitutive. And it brought to mind the architects, brought to my mind the architects of the South African constitution. These Arctic architects took a decision to embrace the term women and men throughout the constitution. Although it might have seemed cumbersome to some, they wanted to stress, as one scholar noted, notwithstanding the assumed reversibility of the masculine rule, it is unlikely that the use of the feminine pronoun is ever intended to embrace the masculine. Therefore, it is important to have both men and women written throughout the constitution. This reminded me then of how Dilma Rousseff, the current president of Brazil, at her first inauguration introduced little touches to signal her wish to be not only a woman president but a women's president. Her black suited bodyguards were all women, six of the motorcycle escorts were women and most importantly there was a special group of women in parliament on the day she took oath. They were former female political prisoners who had been imprisoned and tortured alongside Dilma during the military dictatorship. So 2015 is a watershed year because of the SDGs, because these SDGs which will shape our futures will be promulgated this coming year and you, your charge will be to actualize these goals. Freedom from violence is one of the goals that UN Women has called for. This goal will blaze a trail of what I call second generation or second wave of domestic violence lawmaking. You may have heard that a few days ago, China's State Council announced the draft of China's first national domestic violence law. And last week I was in China working with some of the architects of the law to ensure that all of their recommendations were heard by the State Council during this comment period which ends at the end of this month. My colleague Dr. Amy Gadsden shared a quote with the Chinese experts from Sun Yat-sen's Minister of Justice who said, changes in the laws of the world perpetually result from differences in history, place, race, religion, political systems, mores and customs. But as much as law was molded by society, the minister argued society was molded by law. This quotation provides a perfect framework for my talk on women and lawmaking and how women and women's experiences impact laws.
For the Chinese experts who worked on this draft, this draft marked a 20 year journey. It took 20 years to get to this point. Lawmaking is a slow process. It's a step by step process and most often it is one step forward, two steps back. But it is tenacity that gets us there. And I have been privileged to engage with these gender experts for the last 15 years and I have shared comparative lawmaking processes so as to cross fertilize and cross pollinate ideas. For as a close friend of mine, the former Solicitor General of India Indira Jai Singh, a herself an architect of the Indian domestic violence law has said, we often do not realize it but laws acquire a trans border life on their own and there is no stopping a good idea. And I think that is really at the core of law making, there is no stopping a good idea. Now, the Chinese are very concerned about the gaps in the draft law. The Chinese draft law only covers in its, within its ambit parties to a marriage, parties to a formal marriage. Now when you study, when you examine the first generation of domestic violence laws, you see that only husbands and wives were covered under the ambit of these laws. But the second generation or the second wave of laws cover intimate partners as well as members of the household. And so what I told the Chinese partners is that a law is not immutable, nor is the lawmaking process immutable. It's a dynamic process and it changes with time and place and the community's response to the law. And I shared with them the United States VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, which itself is a dynamic process. Although the VAWA in the US was passed in 1994, it was only in 2013 at the reauthorization of the VAWA was the law explicitly extended to protect the LGBTQ community. So as you can see that itself was a dynamic process. It started in a limited manner but it grew to cover a larger ambit and a larger category of women and men. It was in the reauthorization of the VAWA law in 2005 that Congress took a more holistic approach and uh, covered women with disabilities and immigrant women. So you can see how new categories of women were covered under this evolving lawmaking process. Uh, so what I shared with them was that second generation laws on domestic violence increasingly covers a broad category of persons living under the same roof and not just husbands and wives. For example, the Indonesian law on domestic violence and I want you to um, hear these words cover husbands, wives, children, the people whose family relationship with the individual referred is due to a blood relationship, marriage, suckling at the same breast, care and guardianship and or the individual working to assist the household and living in the household which means domestic workers too. So you can see how the new generation of domestic violence law is not limited to married partners. It covers the household that lives under the same roof and it's broadened and expanded to address the realities of modern life. So next I go to the definition of violence. Now first generation domestic violence laws only saw violence in terms of physical violence and excluded sexual, psychological and economic violence. Now second generation laws cover an expanding category of violence that reflect what I call the many faces of violence which include, as I said before, physical, psychological, economic, sexual and cultural violence. Now, in my conversations with the Chinese architects, I introduce different models, different comparative models of laws so that they could learn from the language, from those laws. So the Indian law covers psychological violence. 
including, and I wanted to listen to the ways in which this is, for me, lawmaking is almost an anthropological study because you see the ways in which society and communities shape these laws and how when women, women are at the table, women's experiences are brought to bear to inform these law and policy making processes. So look at what this law says. The law explains that verbal and emotional abuse under the act includes insults or ridicule, especially with regard to not being able to have a child or a male child. So these are particularly female experiences that are brought to bear in a lawmaking process. Particularly female experiences that would have been excluded or absent if only men were at the table. The Vietnamese law covers psychological damage and again listen to the detail in which it, this is uh, addressed. Psychological damage which prevents the exercise of the legal rights and obligations of the relationship between grandparents and grandchildren. So any kind of coercive action that prevents a grandchild from having a healthy relationship with a grandparent is also considered psychological abuse or psychological damage. Now in the Chinese law, the Chinese lawyers were very concerned that economic abuse was not covered in the law because what they saw was that most of their clients had not only suffered physical abuse but also economic abuse. Now economic abuse provided for in the Indian law includes alienating assets, operating bank accounts or lockers, including her stridhan or dowry constitutes violence. The Bangladeshi laws economic abuse also covers customary practices including the demand of dowry. So you can see the ways in which these laws have evolved. Domestic violence laws, the first generation laws which only covered physical violence have been evolved and revised in the face of women being present at the lawmaking table. When women are present at the policy making table, they bring their narratives to bear on that experience and they share the lived experiences of their lives and shape laws that impact their lives in such intimate and powerful ways. Now I want to take a step back and look at some of the large themes of these lawmaking exercises. Now first generation laws adopted primarily a criminal justice approach and only focused on the punishment of the perpetrator rather than the prevention of violence against women and the services that need to be offered to the survivor and to her family. Now the criminal justice approach itself is inadequate and the second generation laws adopt a hybrid system that includes punishment but also prevention and services to both survivors and family members including housing, social security and education to address gender stereotypes as a way to prevent violence against women. So new and emerging laws or what I call second generation laws include this hybrid system and I want to speak of two major hallmarks of this new and evolving developments in lawmaking. One is the importance of education in addressing gender stereotypes that lead to subordinating women and lead to violence against women. And in doing this, I want to dramatize this example with the case of Maria de Penha in Brazil. Maria de Penha case revolutionized the global landscape on domestic violence lawmaking. At the age of 38, de Penha became a paraplegic as a result of the many acts of violence by her husband, including shots fired at her, attempts to electrocute her and several other assaults. The case of Maria de Penha spawned the adoption of the Maria de Penha law of 2006. And the law called for a multidisciplinary approach to domestic violence including the requirement that young men become educated on issues of sexuality and violence. So this was a new development in laws, the engagement of men and young men in addressing violence against women. 
So male engagement including former male gang members has become a hallmark of the New Zealand uh, domestic violence law. So in New Zealand public service announcements have former male gang members coming on TV to say it is real men don't beat up their women <laughs> and that has become a way in which you draw the community response, a powerful community response and drawing from that Ecuador's national uh, domestic violence law has created a campaign where it says machismo is violence. So you are really looking at the root causes of violence. Many of you may have heard that during uh, the last UN General Assembly in September 2014, Emma Watson, or otherwise better known as Hermione, launched <laughs> UN Women's He for She campaign, He for She. And she called upon boys engagement in combating violence against women. And she said, I call on men and boys everywhere to take a stand against the mistreatment of girls and women. It is by standing up for the rights of girls and women that men truly measure up as men. And as you can see, whether in Boko Haram or the recent carnage in Pakistan, it is more dangerous to be a student than a soldier in the front lines of war. Women and men and girls and boys must join forces to ensure that education is not a victim in the front line of conflict. Education must be at the forefront of building peace. So I want to look at some of the recommended overarching strategies to build either a domestic violence law or any other gender specific or gender sensitive law. And these are some of the cornerstones or building blocks that I shared with my Chinese partners. The importance of building broad networks and alliances. And I often think of the Albright Institute as a microcosm of that perfect alliance. And because when I look at your narratives, when I look at your bios, and I prefer to call them your stories than your bios, you show the ways in which a multidisciplinary transnational network can come together to forge alliances and to build common cause on some of the challenges of our times, to address the most pressing and urgent challenges of the world. And so bringing women and men both from, from different sides of the political parties uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective and public-private partnerships is enormously critical for a lawmaking exercise to succeed. It is also important to build consensus on issues but also to stand firm on what I call the irreducible minimum. You can negotiate on certain issues but there are certain issues that you cannot negotiate on because that's the irreducible minimum that you need for this law to succeed. So as Secretary Albright has said and I quote her, Putting yourself in the other person's shoes, but not forgetting what your goal is in the negotiations. You cannot become co-opted by the other side. So you have to build consensus, but also stand firm on that irreducible minimum. Thirdly, the importance of data in lawmaking. The data is important to create a case for lawmaking. So the data on the numbers of women who are victims and survivors of violence against women. So the United Nations has data that 70% of women in the world have experienced violence from an intimate partner. So this data is staggering. You're not talking of a marginal number of women. You're talking of the majority of women who face violence during the life cycle. Secondly, 
there was this data that I introduced to my Chinese colleagues and they thought that this would be very powerful in their negotiations with the state council. In the Asian region, only China and Burma lack a national domestic violence law. Given China's leadership in the region and given China's new regional foreign policy in the region, it is important for the Chinese government, for the Chinese state to see themselves as a leader in this area. So this speaks loud and clear. You cannot not be a leader in this area. And you would be recalcitrant if your law was not powerful and strong and protect women from violence. And finally, the importance of social movements. Social movements have been the most powerful currents, the most powerful catalysts leading to lawmaking. As the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women has said, perhaps the greatest success story of international mobilization around a specific human rights issue leading to the articulation of international norms and standards and the formulation of international programs and policies has been the international global movement on violence against women. So whether it is social movements in India that was spawned by the Nirbhaya case, the young woman who was raped on a bus two years ago, or the Maria de Penha case in Brazil, or the Family Protection Act of 2007 in Kenya, which was propelled by public support stemming from the 1998 death of Betty Kawata, who was beaten by her policeman husband with a brick after telling him that there was no meat for dinner. So you can say it was social movements and civil society groups that propelled laws. So providing civil society organizations and women's movements support and bolstering their call to action is a cornerstone of good lawmaking. And finally, the intersections of gender, understanding that there is no monolithic definition of woman. Women are defined in terms of race, age, ethnicity, religion, culture, disability, residence, etc. And many new laws on domestic violence ensure that women who face multiple forms of discrimination based on intersecting categories have the services that they need. So that Women with disabilities need different kinds of services. So capturing their needs makes sure that the law does not privilege just one monolithic image of a woman. It is also important to address gender stereotypes in the law. And with that I come to the last lawmaking exercise that I want to present to you that is of the Vietnam gender equality lawmaking process in 2007 and once again I was privileged to engage with the stakeholders who were architects of that law. Now one of the provisions that really struck me and that I helped uh, my peers to work on was article 19 of the gender equality law which is a very novel and groundbreaking provision which was uh, titled the sharing of household work. Now this and I am going to read this provision to you. The duty of both men and women and both boys and girls to participate in family work should be privileged in the law. And it says it, the, uh, the law must educate family members to be responsible in sharing housework and to appropriate allocate housework equally to both boys and girls and to men and women. In a culture that privileges boys' attendance in schools and girls' engagement with housework, this was a very important provision. Now, at the same time, my colleagues in the U.S. would argue, how do you enforce such a law? You know, the law cannot enter the sanctity of a home and a family to ensure that this law is privileged or it's carried out. So what do you do in that case? Firstly, even having this language is educational. As I said earlier, laws are normative, they're constitutive. Laws help to shape social mores, as well as social mores help to shape laws. But finally, it 
is also a way in which these provisions can be used in the case of divorce, in the case of separation, in the case of looking at what constituted the breakdown of a marital relationship and in the allocation of property and the allocation of finances in the breakdown of property. So, there is both what I call an educational aspect to this provision as well as a more pragmatic aspect to this provision. Now, new revisions in laws are trying hard to capture the changing reality of our lives. As I said before, historically men drafted laws and caregiving was considered outside the law making area. It was a laissez faire arrangement between men and women as to how caregiving was arranged and organized. But caregiving laws are now being re envisioned in the image of both men and women, and work family obligations, traditionally thought to be private sphere activities outside of the domain of the law, are now being placed at the very heart of law reform. And harmonizing work family obligations for both men and women is the rallying cry for many new laws. Now, as you know, Nordic countries have long blazed a trail on mandatory family leave and paternal leave for men. And what they call, they have created a fatherhood by gentle coercion through these laws. This is, this is their word. Now, in 1970, and this goes back a long time, in 1970, when then Prime Minister of Sweden, Roloff Palm, was invited to speak at the Women's National Democratic Club in Washington, D.C., he surprised the audience by naming his presentation the emancipation of man. And this is what he said, for in order for women to be emancipated, men must be emancipated. The men should have a larger share in the various aspects of family life and child care. And that is what I call emancipation of man, he said. And this was in 1970. But I am more interested in ways in which uh, emerging law reform initiatives are grappling with the emancipation of man. The Kyrgyz Republic, Kyrgyzstan's law has a special provision that focuses on sharing of household duties, which states persons of both sexes shall bear equal obligations with regard to household work. And the law states that household work may not be used as a means of gender discrimination and it may be performed equally by men and women. So, these are emerging new democracies that are experimenting with these new forms of law making. But gender discrimination in household duties or in the workplace or gender stereotypes that impede egalitarian arrangements both in the home and in the workplace are not limited to the world outside of the US. In the US too, after childbirth, women employees have been stripped of management roles, given duties of modest importance and excluded from high level discussions. There are cases where bosses have told their employees, women employees, why aren't you at home eating bonbons because you have children. Many women have reported that when they were asked, uh, when they asked why they were not promoted, the supervisor allegedly stated, because you have kids. In one particular case that I want to share with you, Elena Back was a school psychologist who had received glowing performance re reviews until she became a mother. She was denied tenure in her school because supervisors allegedly made comments to her such as, it is not possible for you to be a good mother and have this job. So, she went to court and the, cool, the court ruled that stereotypical, uh, stereotypical remarks about the incompatibility of motherhood and employment is certainly evidence that stereotyping of women as caregivers can be harmful to gender equality in the workplace. So, you see the correlationship between equality in the home and equality in the workplace. Now, in China too, under the guise of protecting women, women are disallowed in the law from working underground, above ground, from nighttime duties and travel related employment opportunities. So, some of my research assistants have examined the job advertisements 
by the public service in China. And these jobs, these job announcements, advertisements, especially from on public service, explicitly note that uh, only male applicants are wanted because these jobs involve working in harsh conditions, travel and on-site investigation. So women are excluded from a plethora of job opportunities in the law itself and the law explicitly marginalizes women from these job opportunities. Now that is why it is important to have women as decision makers. As Kim Campbell, the former Prime Minister of Canada has stated, what the presence of women in power does, whether in parliament or on the bench, is it makes possible for men to be more of the things they want to be. As more women began to be elected to the House of Commons, more male members were delighted because they also had families and they wanted to see their children and they wanted to preserve their marriages, the way in which women wanted to see their children and to preserve their marriages. Because after all, men and women are human beings who share similar human aspirations. So I finally go back to where we started. We mark the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Platform of Action and the Beijing Conference. Secretary Clinton said women's rights are human rights. And the editor of the Foreign Policy Journal last year said, the underrepresentation of women in positions of power is proof, not so much that men still dominate the top of the pyramid, as it is a system of the most egregious, widespread, pernicious, destructive pattern of human rights abuses in the history of civilization. And he is a man, the editor of the Foreign Policy Journal. So the lack of women in decision making processes is a human rights abuse. And let's look at the numbers. Although the Beijing platform of action called for a 30% critical mass of women in national legislative bodies, 20 years later today, we have only 37 countries that have reached the 30% critical mass in national legislative bodies. And only Rwanda has over 50% women represented in their legislative body. And if you think these numbers are low, the numbers are dire in the arena of women in peace and security. In the last 20 years, less than 3% of the signatories to peace treaties were women and less than 7.6% of negotiating parties were women. And 2015 happens to mark the 15th anniversary of the Security Council Resolution 1325, which called for women's leadership in post-conflict. So although the Security Council Resolution articulated a greater space for women, what we see is that not a single woman has been appointed chief or lead peace mediator in a UN-sponsored peace talk. And what we saw in my discussion was that when women are not represented, women's experiences are absent from the laws and communities are impoverished. When women constitute over 50% of the population, these numbers question the very foundation of democracy. As the Secretary General of the Organization of American States once said, democracy without women is only half democracy. And you are about to change that. That is why the Albright Institute has created a crucible for women's leadership where women will have a seat at the table along with men at the helm of decision making and finish the unfinished business of the 21st century. That is your charge and the time is now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Talene. 
Um, and I'm actually part of the good governance group here for the SDGs. And I was wondering, in our group, we're talking a lot about national governance versus global governance. And you talked a lot about enacting national laws and kind of national agency and getting women and women's rights at the forefront of legislation. I was wondering how much of a role can international pressure play? And do you have any examples of changes that come from the international community within a country level? Right. Now, that's a good question. And, you know, as I said, my, I had to be very selective in what I shared with you. But my role in many of these lawmaking processes has been twofold. One is to share comparative good practice examples. But most importantly, to share international conventions, international norms as blueprints for the lawmaking and the policy making processes. So in all of these processes, the starting point were the international human rights norms, whether it be the UDHR or the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. They were my global bill of rights. They were the blueprints that I shared with them. And most often what you see is that my peers, the architects of the laws, these were their laws, not my laws, that they use these blueprints and the language of these blueprints in a very in assiduously, in a very, in very religiously, to make sure that these international norms, as you said, Telen, would be translated into national lawmaking processes. So these are the blueprints. The architecture of these national laws are represented in the international human rights framework. So it's a matter of transforming those international norms into national and local laws. But you know, lawmaking, as I said earlier, is just the beginning of this journey. It is not the end. A law is important. It is, as I said, it is not only a legal document. For me, it's also an anthropological, sociological document. Because you, know, you see this journey, a 20-year journey of social movements, struggling, negotiating, um, dialoguing, having these global transnational conversations with their sisters and their brothers from around the region, from around the world. It is such a powerful 20-year moment, if I may call it a moment. And so it's a, it, the law is much more than what we see present. There are stories written, the testimonies of the women, survivors of violence, the testimonies of the prosecutors, the defenders. So uh, the implementation of the law is critical. And that is really what is going to be the decisive moment for the SDGs. In the SDGs must ensure that these are not just rhetoric, that they are not hortatory um, articulations of human rights, but they are actually claimed in a court of law. And that these norms are invoked in courts of law and that redress and recourse to justice and the rule of law is ensured. And that is what good governance is all about. And I'm so glad that you brought up the good governance issue. What is good governance? You know, the rule of law and access to justice are the cornerstones, the bedrock of good governance. Yes. Helen. Helen. So as a woman of Chinese nationality, I think it's really great to hear of the initiatives beginning to sort of draft this policy against uh, anti-violence policy. So I was wondering, as you mentioned, language is extremely important in drafting law. And as you are sharing your expertise with your colleagues in other countries, and as communication occurs back and forth, and as they draft as you know, architects in their country, do you see anything lost in translation or challenges that you face in this communication? Right. That's a very, very interesting question. And I think that's an overarching question uh, that I always ask uh, of myself and of my uh, peers in different countries. But you know, the way in which both I as well as my peers resolve this issue is these, you know, Taylor mentioned these global human rights norms. They are universal norms. They are not limited to the global north or the global south. These are not US-led norms. The China is a signatory 
to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So they are bound to follow this international convention. And by that they have pledged to be governed by this global governance system. And yes, there are cultural, there are certain cultural particularities, but violence, no culture, as I said, you know, culture is dynamic. No culture allows for violence against women. Male patriarchies allow for violence against women, but that is not embedded in the culture. And Amatya Sen, who has spoken uh, uh, very powerfully about the ways in which you reconcile culture and human rights has stated within our own cultures, whether it is in India or China or Peru, there are in our own histories, in our own culture, we can dig deep and find values that protect the rights of women. We do not only have to depend on the global human rights framework. That is an important first step and that is an universal framework. But there are also cultural norms deeply embedded that must be reinterpreted by women, by feminists to elevate the rights of women that provide for the protection of women. So it is about really reclaiming these cultural norms and reinterpreting these norms from a feminist perspective. So when you talk of you know what might be lost in translation, well first and foremost and this is not your question, these uh, human rights norms are in Chinese, you know it, it is not just in English, it is in Chinese and these norms are what they use as the bedrock principles for the lawmaking uh, process. But then there are certain uh, ways in which it may, the time may not be right for a particular provision. So for example, and I want to be very uh, specific, so when we were discussing the ways in which uh, the Chinese law limited violence to physical violence and excluded psychological, economic, emotional and cultural violence. Uh, some of these lawyers and other advocates felt that this was so limiting that they were, there was a struggle as to should we include in this language in our recommendations economic abuse as well as um, marital rape, as sexual abuse. And, and the women's community was divided. Some of the lawyers wanted economic abuse because they felt that that was winnable, that the Chinese state would be more willing to allow for economic abuse rather than um, uh, marital rape and sexual abuse because that was considered sensitive, politically sensitive. And so at that point the question was do we go with everything we want or are we going to be politically astute and go with the winnable issue in order to just get that because if we ask for too much the government there might be a backlash and say no this is it. So that is a very political decision and only they can make that decision because it is only the community that can, can decide what is politically astute for us. But my point was once you take the decision the women's movement must unite behind that because there is no strength in division, there is only strength in numbers and in unity. So you, once you negotiate what is right at this moment in time, there has to be a coalition that then forges what I call, you know, a shared understanding of what needs to be done. So I think that's, so you are right about what is lost, I think nothing is really lost, but each political and cultural context is different. And it is different at that particular moment in time and what I told them was lawmaking is dynamic. You might want to come back in a year or two and then go back and then ask for what you lost because as I said even in the US it was a process. So I think you are right, it is 
It is about looking at the international framework and then looking at Yes, we understand we want everything, but we might have to negotiate with ourselves and with the government about what can be done at this moment without really diluting the core demands of what we want. So that's important too. That's a great question. I think she, uh, yes, and then you. And I was, you talked a lot about um, lawmaking and women's role in lawmaking, but I was wondering what you thought about or what you thought can be done in cases where there's a, a bridge or a huge gap between the law and practice. And in my, in my home state, we have a law that states that political parties need to cover, during elections, need to cover a quota of female candidates to run for Congress. Um, and the media has reacted, has had a lot of very positive coverage towards this law, but in, in practice, it women are, this quota is covered by placing women as substitutes for the candidates, if the candidates ever decide to step down and run for another position. So what, what, what do you think could, is, could be done in cases like, where there's this bridge and what role should women play in this case? Uh, where are you? Mexico, Monterrey. From Mexico. Okay, now good question. I think it comes in two parts. One is about the gap between laws on paper and laws in practice, which is a universal challenge. And then the second is the qu question of quotas and the importance of quotas in bringing women to positions of power as policymakers and to the law drafting table. The so first as to this, uh, the gap between laws in practice and laws in um, laws on the paper. And I see that everywhere I go. You know, you know, this is these laws are almost always perfect. And even incomplete laws have something in them. But most often what I see is that these laws are privileged in the breach, what I call in the privilege in the breach. They are either not privileged, not enforced, or privileged in the breach. And there's very little education or awareness raising done about these laws. So, you know, after all, what is the point of these laws? I mean, as I said, as a lawyer, as someone who's been engaged in this process, I still think of these laws and the making of these laws is an important political process. It brings, as I said, forges uh, parties and alliances together. It creates, you know, if you don't have a law, on what do you depend on? On the charity of the state? On the goodwill of the state? I mean, you're talking of good governance. I mean, good governance laws, you need to have a statement of principles and laws are those statements of principle. Otherwise, you're depending on religion, on moral authority, on political authority, political capital to redress um, grievances. So, and a law is, has value if you can claim the law, the claim the right. So it's important to have access to justice for women, to have legal aid for women and most of all, you know, I look at these laws from China, in many of these countries, they lack a budget. You know, where are the finances to implement the laws? So, and who's, who has the authority to implement the laws? So one of the biggest drawbacks the Chinese law, as some of the Chinese experts articulate, is that there is no allocation of responsibilities and duties. So you have all these statements on for law enforcement, on due diligence. So due diligence is another evolving and powerful international law norm which places responsibility on state and state actors for not just action but for inaction. So inaction as in if you, if you fail to respond in an appropriate manner, then you are complicit in the violence against women. So if you as a prosecutor or law enforcement official or a magistrate fail to appropriately respond, although you were not directly responsible for the violence, you are indirectly responsible because it was your authority. You did not act with due diligence. So 
it is. So, state responsibility is enormously powerful, it is an imperative and how do we exercise that, how do we claim that and that is why you need to have vigilant civil society actors who are watchdogs, who are crying out not just the language is very important and language is as I said not innocent. But we also have to make sure that the implementing processes are also enshrined in the law. So, I always look at you know what is the addendum, what is the law, how is it, what is the budget for this law. And in China what I advised them was you know what the VAWA did was it looked at the cost of violence again, the VAWA here in the US, the cost of violence against women. It cost the state, a community billions of dollars in uh, uh, when women face violence, in absenteeism in work, in healthcare costs, in legal aid costs, in, in law enforcement costs. It is cheaper for a community, for a state to have a, a budget to prevent violence against women than to have women who are either survivors or victims of violence. So, having that as a strong uh, making having that data creates a strong claim or a strong case for not just the law, but for a budget. So, data collection is important to make sure that you have implementing mechanisms. Because otherwise for most often for these states its laws is ok, it is 20 years after the Beijing conference we have to show the world we have done something. So, let us create some kind of uh, an action plan that makes us look good right. Now, that is just whitewashing, that is public relations. But if you really show and most of you I mean I have read your bios, I have read your stories, there are very you know impressive uh, economists here in this room. So, if you can provide the data to show violence is costly, gender discrimination is costly, sexual harassment, sexual abuse is costly, that speaks loud and clear to governments. So, you have the moral story on the one side, you know it is the right thing to do, but you have to show it is the smart thing to do. So, you both have the moral claim and then you have the economic case that you are making for these laws. Then your second uh, comment about the importance of quotas. So, in my study of women in decision making and women in political participation, what you see is that of the countries that have reached what I said the 30 percent critical mass number of women in parliament two thirds of those countries that have reached that critical mass percentage are countries in post conflict that have enshrined a quota in their either legislation or in their constitution. So, quotas are the fast, fast track women to government and to decision making and these quotas are not you know favors that women are asking. It is a way in which to address a legacy of discrimination that women have faced historically. So, it is a way of what I call equalizing the playing field for women and they have worked. And the, the CEDA, you talked to the CEDA before calls for temporary special measures. They are only temporary till the playing field is equal and then you review those legislation and you remove them. And when I was working in Kenya, what I was very impressed was that the Kenyan constitution calls for quotas, a two third quota for either gender in parliament, because it envisions a time when men might be a minority in parliament. <laughs> so that, because as I said before, this is not just having only one gender represented, it is about having both men and women equally represented, the richness of the multiplicity of plural voices at the law making table. Hello, my name is Priyanka and um, I, I liked what you were saying about Amartya Sen. And one thing you talked about was uh, 
the reconcilable tension between culture and human rights. But I was wondering, have there been situations where it seems like it isn't reconcilable, where you can't just attribute their... I, I, when I think of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, one thing they talk about is, Martha Nussbaum talks about is the multiple realizability that you have when you have sort of like objective human capabilities or functionings. We can think about some things that are fundamental that can be applied in different ways. But do you think that there are perhaps situations where there are things in certain cultures which seem to violate what what others, what like the international organizations see as like fundamental human rights and how do you, how then do you deal with it if we right. can't Good examine question, the culture? Good question and complicated question. So going back to Amartya Sen, what he says is, you know, for long human rights, the human rights project has seen as a Western project and that is why this antipathy by uh, the global south. You know, just before the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights 20 years ago, the Asian region led by the Singaporean government said, you know, these are Western values and we have Asian values. And so the, all the other, you know, the civil society in Asia said, we never realized Asia was this monolithic with this like one Asian value. <laughs> this is all very new to us. Tell us what Asian values mean. So it was of course a very instrumental, very self-serving way of saying development first, human rights second by the Singaporean government and by the other, uh, the Asian states that backed that Asian values argument. But as we know, you know, there is no, you know, there is no one monolithic value system anywhere. If at all, it's universal human rights, which are a monolithic value system. So Amartya Sen said, well, one way to address this is by finding the roots of human rights in our own cultures, in our own histories, whether it's in the Arab tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition, the Confucian tradition, to find it deep within our own traditions and to assert them through that lens so that that provides resonance in communities where you need that cultural roots and those cultural legitimacy. So it is a very practical way of looking at it, both a practical also much more uh, universal way of uh, adjudicating these claims. Now your question about are there times when you see these as inconsistent? Yes, as they are articulated by male hegemonies, they are inconsistent. When you look at, you know, the Islamic jurisprudence, the Islamic jurisprudence as articulated by men would see that there's a division between human rights and the Islamic traditions. But as we know, more and more women are reclaiming the Islamic tradition and articulating it within a feminist lens. And there we see that the Islamic traditions and women's rights are compatible, that they are not inconsistent, that Islamic democracy is not in any way uh, an inconsistent norm, and that women's rights and Islam can coexist. So I think it depends on who has the right to interpret these norms. And the right to interpret, and that is why we need women at the table to be able to interpret our sacred texts, to be able to interpret our histories and our traditions. Who gives another the right to interpret my history or my traditions or my sacred texts? Yes, I think you and then you. Right. I mean, as I mentioned, we have the data, the worldwide data to say 70% of women face some kind of abuse, some kind of violence during, the li during their life cycle. 
So this universalizes. This is not, you know, either women of a certain caste or a certain class, economic class or a certain ethnicity. This is pervasive, unfortunately. This is an epidemic. Violence against women is an epidemic. And it is about the perpetrator has to be stigmatized, not the survivor of violence or the victim of violence. And that is why even language that we've gone from, you know, calling women who face violence victims to survivors. And that the perpetrator is the one who should face, and I don't say that that's what always happens, who should face the stigmatization. But I think more and more communities are dealing with survivors of violence with sensitivity. And as I said, these second generation laws try, make a good faith attempt to deal with those uh, much more nuanced social problems by uh, including violence against women in school curricula, in educational curricula. Uh, you know, I was very proud when the young woman from Colombia, you know, carry my weight. Uh, you know, she was not, I and mean, she is a representative of a very strong woman. You know, she's very highly accomplished in a school that values accomplishments, being not afraid. <coughs> to go in front of the public, the world stage, to announce that not only is she a, 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 a survivor of violence, but that she speaks for all women in her situation and using the installation art of carrying her weight as a way in which to proclaim that and to claim that. So I think more and more women are, you know, it's being unmasked, the, the stigmatization, this is being unpacked. And the real face of violence, the ugliness of violence, and the ugly mask of violence should be, should, is a mask that should be worn by the perpetrator. So I think more and more when women come out claiming violence and what has happened to them, that helps to, uh, to address this. But again, I think we also have to respect a woman's privacy. You know, not all women are, you know, I think her name is Emma Sarkovics. There are women in, in Nepal who may not want to do that. And we need to be able to respect her right not to come out and to remain anonymous. One last question. Yes. And I think there was, we, shall we take three questions together? <laughs> Hi, Charlotte Weiss. Uh, you spoke about the importance of education as not being on the front lines of war, um, but being on the front lines of building peace. And I was wondering if you could talk about like how we build laws so that we can secure peace in our educational spaces. <laughs> I wish I, I had more than one minute to answer that question, but I'll quickly take a couple of other questions. Uh, um, hi, my name is Nikita. Um, and I'm wondering in a lot of the countries that need these systems, um, there's also a lack in the education systems, especially at higher education um, levels. And those are most of the, the low rates are most prevalent for women. And so um, in those places when there aren't women who have the education levels to actively participate in policymaking, how do you address that problem? Good, very good question. And the third question. Gab. Hi, my name is Gabby. Um, so we had a talk before lunch about um, like women in the workplace and that when women come to uh, decision-making positions in corporations and business, um, they often make more morally correct decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so like better governance mm -hmm. in corporations. I was wondering if there is that same phenomenon um, when there's an increase in women in government? It's a great question. So I'm going to answer your question first. So uh, there's, there's a paucity of data 
on the impact of women in decision making in parliaments as well as in other bodies of governance. There is more data on what happens when women are in corporate boards. There is the data which really shows that having women in boards is a smart thing to do. There is less data on women in parliaments. But data out of the Kennedy School done by Rohini Pandey and I think many of you may have read her work that was published in the, in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, where they have done a data collection and uh, evidence based research on women in local government, the Panchayat uh, Raj in India, which shows that when women are equally represented or women are a majority in these uh, local government or village councils, change happens. Women, that there is uh, uh, less violence and less corruption, and that issues such as access to water, access to education are privileged. Issues that have hitherto not been addressed when men were dominant in the village council. And just to give you one example from my own experiences working with the uh, village councils is that uh, there, was a, uh, there was not enough money to buy um, uh, school books in the village schools. And so these women at the table looked at the budget for the village council, the budget for tea, to, for, for, the, for the tea for the village council. They found that they were allocated 10 cups of tea and so many pounds of sugar for that. And they said, you know, why do we need more than one cup for a meeting? Why do we need 10 cups, an allocation for sugar? Let's reallocate that money for school books. So you're having women at the table you know, looking at the available resources and reallocating that is a very practical, pragmatic way. So yes, we need more data on what happens. I obviously, we need more data to show, to make a case for more women heads of state more women in parliament, more women in village council. We have the data on more women in village council. We have less data, research based evidence. Because what I told you, that's why I have used narratives and case studies to show what happens. What are the, how are laws impacted? So I have studied the laws and seen, you know, when women are at the table, you can see there's a whole difference in the language of the law, the provisions of the law, the resources that are allocated in the law. But we need to see how when women are at the table, that countries are safer, that women and bo men both enjoy more gre greater security. Then your question on, um, what is your question? Um, including women's voices. Including women's voices from all different sectors. That's a very important question. And again, I think that goes back to my first generation lawmaking, second generation lawmaking. My experience working with uh, architects on law reform in Pakistan and the narratives they tell me was in the 1960s and 1970s it was an elite women's movement, you know, educated women, women from law schools, public policy schools, women who were, uh, uh, whose voices were amplified were at the table making these laws, advocating for these laws. But over time what you see is that the face of the women's movements around the world has changed that you find a richer chorus of voices now in women's movement and that there is this richness and plurality of voices and the understanding that there isn't a one woman, there isn't an able-bodied, middle-class, heterosexual uh, woman there, that women, that, the, that there is a greater heterogeneity in that term, um, woman, and that's really what makes us rich. So, thank you. Thank you.